Okay, we begin with the altruistic motivation. All mothers sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. <clears throat> All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Da gla dang wa je pe dra no pa je pe ge. Tar pa dang tam she ken pe bar du jo pa je pa tam she ki so je pe. Ma nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang den. Dug now dang drell nor do la na me pa yang dag pa zog pe zang ju ben po she to pa ja. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. They say do sang ma ge gi ba do lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Ma she ba do lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Do de ring ne song te ni ma sang ta sam gi ba do. Lu nagi sam ge wa la ko. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the Eye of Wisdom. We take refuge in the Kind Root and Lineage Lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the Mandalas of the Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the Eye of Wisdom. Jiren San Sa Wa Dangu Pa Je Pe Pa Dan La Ma Dam Pa Nam La Kab Su Chi Yo. Ye Dam Kil Gor Gi La Sok Nam La Kab Su Chi Yo. Sange chom den de nam la kab su chi o. Tam pe cho nam la kab su chi o. Pa pe ge du nam la kab su chi o. Pa wo ka jo cho kyong song me song yes ye gi chang dang dem ba. Nam la kab su chi o. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, 
I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Shangju Ning Po Chi Ki Ba Sange Nam La Kab Su Chi Cho Dang Shang Shu Sam Pa Yi So Klang De Shin Kab Su Chi Jeta Nong Gi De She Gi Shang Shu Tug Ni Ke Pa Dang Shang Shu Sam Pe La Pa La Te Dag Rim Shin E Pa Ta Te Shin Dro La Pan Dan Du Shang Shu Sam Ni Ke Gi Shing De shin du ni la pa la, rim pa shin du la pa ji o. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangha Cho Dang So Ki Cho Nam La Shang Ju Ba Du Dagni Kab Su Chi Dagi jin so ki pe so nam gi Dro la pen shir sangye ju pa sho May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Ma nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang de we gurdang dem ba jo chi. Dug now dang de now gi gu dang dra wa jo chi. Dug now me pe de wa dang mi dra wa jo chi. Ne ring jack dang ni dang dra we dang nam la ne pa jo chi. And then we go to page 12, please. The Sagar Mati requested sutra. Likewise, be extinguished, extinguished all enemies to my purpose. Whatever evil forces are in me, be defeated. Do this so that when I am victorious, all pure radiance melts into me, completely purified. Take all this knowledge, food and drink peacefully and enjoy it, and be satisfied so that all obstacles may be destroyed. Be liberated from all obstacles all general obstacles. Maras are defeated by this gesture of the Buddha. By reciting this mantra, may all the Maras be purified. As a result, may all the Maras be defeated. Thank you very much. Okay. So does anybody have questions or comments? I know I asked this a few minutes ago, but some new people came on and just want to make sure that uh, if you have any uh, thoughts that you want to express, 
any questions <clears throat> anything based on what we've been talking about on Sundays or, or the Monday night sessions? Okay. Then everybody's good. Um, we're going to continue talking uh, about Bodhicitta uh, on Sunday. We, we introduced Bodhicitta yesterday, and uh, we laid some very good groundwork, I think, but there's still a few more points that need to be to be made and some more thoughts about it. So we will uh, continue that. Um, today we are going to talk about uh, emptiness. And emptiness is one of the most subtle uh, of the different topics that uh, are in the Dharma teachings. So it takes uh, quite a while, I think, to be able to take in the information about what it is emptiness and to be able to process it then takes repeated uh study repeated um, uh, contemplation repeated um meditation it is uh the idea of emptiness is is really the um the the meditation is what really leads to our being able to really um uh, have a glimpse at the emptiness because we have to transcend our everyday uh, awareness, our everyday knowledge, our everyday uh, experiences as an ordinary human being to be able to get to the perspective, to be able to recognize what this emptiness really is. By doing so, there is a great deal of liberation. There's a great deal of freedom that comes by way of this. So um, take notes, please. And uh, I sent you uh, two um, chapters uh, from the book, uh, Learning Buddhism, which in this particular case for both the bodhicitta and for the emptiness are very, very good chapters uh, to get some uh, background from uh, Kempo Samduk and uh, the, the talk that I'm about to engage in uh, are coming from these, these chapters. So um, he did a very good job uh, about talking about this. So um, we'll, we'll start with that, with, with his teaching on this. Uh, there are many other teachers who have equally great teachings as well. So if you have other books or other recordings, things that you have been able to, uh, to secure for yourselves, by all means, go right ahead and uh, refer to them as well. Um, last time I was down at Dharma Surya, uh, there appeared a few more copies of this, some new copies. It's been out of print for several years. And um, so I don't know where the copies came from, but they were brand new and somebody had them stashed away somewhere and discovered them, I suppose. So if anybody wants a copy of the Learning Buddhism, I recommend that you uh, get in touch with me or get in touch with the people at uh, Dharma Surya and, um, and ask for a copy to be sent to you, to be held and sent to you. Uh, I think when I was there, there was only maybe five or six copies. So uh, we'd have to think that those could very well be the last copies. <laughs> yeah, I think there are two or three now. Oh, is that right? I think, yes. I've sold oh. a couple. Would okay. that be part of the lending library, like where you just share it and then forward it out? No, these are these are brand new books, so they're not part of the lending library. So I have uh, the PDFs of each of these chapters, and I can send you, if anybody wants them, I can send the PDFs, but then you'd be required to print them or at least download them onto your digital device and, and read from them. Um, for myself, you know, I take notes on these chapters. So uh, just keeping it in digital form is very difficult to be able to take those kinds of notes like that. So I suggest that you read that, uh, that you print them so that you can take notes right in the margins right alongside of what you're reading. So, um, that's how I do it anyway. 
So if anybody wants these chapters, I just sent chapter six and seven to everybody today. So you can download them uh, right away. They're, they're in the WhatsApp, uh, uh, the WhatsApp group. Okay. So to begin with, we have to understand that there are two truths in Buddhism. And this was a mind blower for me many years ago because here I am struggling, you know, going through all these meditation techniques and all these different, uh, all these different um, uh, traditions that I've been, uh, that I've gone through in my many years and so on, and looking for the truth. There has to be one truth. And Buddhism stands up and says, well, there's two truths. And I said, oh, doesn't that make sense? <laughs> so, um, so the two truths are, are very simple to define. There is the relative truth, and there is the ultimate truth, or the absolute truth. Those two words can be interchangeable, ultimate or absolute. So the relative truth is the truth in which we are functioning. This temporary, phenomenal, uh, apparitional, kind of a, a, a truth, this reality that we exist in. And uh, everything appears to us, appears to us as being permanent, appears to us as being real and so. But everything is all just temporary in that none of it is going to last forever. And that's one of the definitions here of, of what relative phenomenal truth is that it is temporary. In other words, we're all compounded. Everything's compounded. Everything's made up of many other things. Very, nothing is, is pure unto its own. And we can look at that just by, say, looking at the human body, which we think is to some degree permanent, you know, for these many years and so on. But, but we, we can look at our hand and we can say, well, here's my hand, but, but uh, if, if I look underneath the skin, I see all kinds of tissues and I see all kinds of muscles and I see all kinds of tendons. And then if I look a little deeper, I can see the, uh, the, 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 the bones and so on. And if I look a little deeper from that, I can start seeing molecules that are bonded together and then look a little deeper than that, I can see atoms that are forming the molecules. And then I look in the atoms and I can see the atoms uh, have subatomic particles, neutrons and protons and electrons. And then I can see that they're made up of, of subatomic particles of muons and gluons and all these things that are all suspended in this space. So my hand, my body, when I pass, is going to start to decompose. And all these things are going to start breaking down. And they're going to start breaking down into all these elements and so on, all these basic particles. <clears throat> and so it is for all these other things. My beads, my bell, you know, all these different physical objects that we have that appear to be permanent, but we know that if we leave them outside in the elements, the rain, the snow, and the wind, and all these things, over some period of time, they're all going to break down, and they are going to decay and, and decompose and go back into their, their uh, to these fundamental elements of being protons and muons and all this kind of stuff. So defining the relative is by understanding that all this is relative to something else, that this is all appearances for us, and that we agree on what they are as being permanent, but then we find out that they are impermanent, that they are temporary. So these, so when we say they appear, it means that we're recognizing them in their compounded form that when all the electrons and so on come together and all the protons come together and so on, that they begin to form the elements that, that make this bell. And 
Um, but when that begins to break apart, then they go back to those fundamental elements, which they themselves are compounds of other things and so on. So this is a basic idea of being able to explain phenomenal nature. The phenomenal nature is compounded nature, that it all breaks down at some point. And the longer that we hold on to the proposition that all this is real, that becomes an impediment, that becomes a hindrance to our, to our being able to liberate from our human nature, from this phenomenal nature, because we have this idea that all this is permanent. We have this idea that this is eternal. We have these ideas that this will not go away and so on. So we take, we take great comfort in that. Our ego likes that. So, so if we're able to, to let go that all this is going to go away, um, helps us to recognize that we can liberate, that there's nothing to hold on to, that all this is just a fabrication of the mind. So let's come back to that. This ultimate truth now, the ultimate truth, is what is realizing that. In other words, that there's this phenomenal stuff that has all this myriad, how we say, um, multi, um, multiplicity of truth, all these different phenomenal things, all the scientific explorations and the scientific experiments and all the formulas and all this kind of stuff that justifies what all this phenomenal stuff is. It all, it all can be formulated and so on. And then it can even, in many cases, be synthesized it can be created in a laboratory, although it may be organic as we look at it, but they're finding ways to synthesize all of this. So being able to recognize all that in that nature is the phenomenal, is the, is the ultimate truth, that we can see that, that we can recognize that. But by seeing it doesn't make it any less temporary. So being able to see it in that sense, and I'm using the word seeing as a as a um, as just a construct of a thought to be able to, to to say, well, this this is in this form, this exists in this way, but it's something that's beyond that, because this ultimate nature is beyond our our human conception. Are, are being able to, to, uh, to actually understand what it is. So this flies in the face of a lot of, you know, uh, justification for, for science, for doing things and so on. But it also, you know, is a release of the idea that human beings can know all these things and that there is, there is peace and that there is liberation by stopping to play this, this game that we play to, that, that puts us in the center of being able to understand everything. So this is a spiritual proposition that may, you know, challenge your preconceived ideas and so on. So without investigating this, we fall prey to the notion of this permanence. So the process of going through a logical exploration is what enables us to be able to, to recognize this compounded nature, then to exhaust all of that and to be able to rest and be able to have that meditative experience that we've talked about so many times. So this compounded phenomena, which we ex experience as being truly existent, is just merely the, the relative truth, because we are under the influence of our delusion. So this comes under the heading of ignorance. So we talk about the five basic poisons, if you recall, and the mother or the, the, the fundamental uh, poison is this ignorance that we think that we are real. We think that all this is real. And then in this 
false reality, then all these other things become apparent to us. They appear to us, but they themselves are empty of their own true nature. We are empty of our own true nature. My bell is empty of its own true nature. And all our thoughts are empty of their own true nature. All our concepts are all fabricated mental ideas to be able to have a conversation between ourselves and within ourselves. So we say that all this is empty of its own true nature. And this is the emptiness. The emptiness is that all of this is temporary. All of this is non-existent. All of this is a fabrication of the mind. This is the essence of the arising of all these things. This is the, the natural emptiness that pervades all phenomenal nature. So when we talk about phenomenal nature, we're talking about it as only being relative, as being existent by what we say that it is, it is like this, but it's not like this. That it, is, that it is temporary, that we can judge it against something else. So we're, we're looking at it in a relative way. So this is the essence of this phenomenon. And the emptiness pervades all of that. So another way of saying this is that no phenomena has any true existence. So it's looking at it from another point of view. And this is what we need to do is to be able to build and, and start to understand our different points of view of looking at things. So if we're looking at things in purely phenomenal nature, everything's going to seem real to us. But if we can uh, transcend our ordinary human consciousness and look at things from the relative, or excuse me, from the ultimate point of view, then we can see the relative as just being temporary. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what we, that's what we do. So our mind is a subjective mind. We focus on a, a subject, and then we try and find objects to justify the subject. That needs a little bit of thought. These things, we need to, to maybe explore some dictionary definitions on these things. Because we have these assumptions about what these things mean, and we may be looking at things from their outermost definitions instead of looking at their deeper inner definitions. So just simply looking at the, the way these words have developed and the different levels of what these words break down to is something that a good dictionary, excuse me, will reveal to us. So this helps us to be able to understand the language that we've been using to justify this relative point of view that we have about everything. So when we are doing all this, all these thoughts are running around in our mind, in our intellectual mind. And our intellectual mind is another one of these concepts. The intellectual mind is part of our physical body. It's part of our brain. All these thoughts, if they were real and if they were permanent, then we would remember everything that happened from prior lifetimes. We would remember and we would be able to see what happens with other people and, and read their minds and so on. But we can't do that because they are all temporary. They are all just illusions that we have, have, have used to justify our real existence. So the nature of our mind, the nature of mind, our intellectual mind, is this emptiness. When we talk about the absolute mind, when we talk about our primordial mind, 
now we're talking about the mind that is beyond our physical or intellectual mind. We're going beyond that. To be able to describe that is impossible because it's beyond what our intellectual mind can formulate, can grasp, can conceive of, can approach, can express, however it can be experienced. And this is another part of the mind blower, you know, that when we engage in our deep samadhi practices, and that we are eliminating, eliminating, eliminating. We are exhausting, exhausting, exhausting all this logical exploration. Then what we become left with is just this pure vibration, this pure spirit. However, whatever word we can use, we begin, we have an experience with that. But if, as I'm saying, it's beyond our, our being able to communicate it but we can experience it. So when we experience it, then it starts, then you go, oh, now I see. Now I can, I, I, I have the, the understanding of what this is because I've experienced it, but yet it's something beyond the ability for the intellectual mind to be able to, to grasp the essence, to be able to describe it. What we do do is we come back and as our intellectual mind catches up with that ultimate mind, that absolute mind, we begin to try and qualify it. We, we want to be able to communicate it to ourselves and to other people. And the way in which it's been done is by saying, well, oh, I know it's love. That there is this, there is this sense of of, of unity, there's a sense of oneness, there's a sense of, 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 uh, of oneness, you know, the, the, what other conceptual words can we use to try and say it? So we say love, and then we say, well, you know, and when we're not in that love, then we have compassion, because that compassion is the suffering that we have by not realizing the love. So we create this idea of compassion. So, so loving kindness, love is one side of the hand and the compassion is the other side of the hand. And they go together, they're inseparable from each other. And this is, this is a, a manifestation of the human mind to be able to, to try and conceptualize this ultimate this ultimate primordial mind. So <clears throat> again, to an everyday rational mind, this is going to be very subtle. This is going to befuddle us. This is, but through the, the practice of developing the meditation and being able to allow ourselves to use the logic to say, well, it's this, it's this, it's this, and then by saying, oh, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that, and getting to the point of, of being able to just say, well, I don't know what it is, and then all of a sudden, then something opens up within ourselves, and we have that experience. So this emptiness is seen from the point of view of the ultimate, not necessarily from the point of view of the relative. We intellectually say it, but we can't see it until we've experienced the ultimate. So how do we do that? We do it through ultimate experience, or uh, excuse me, direct experience is the way that we do that. So this direct experience is our meditative experience. And we are, to do that, we have to go through this whole process of our intellectual mind, this, this, this investigation, this um, a contemplation, which is really purifying the obstacles that are blocking us from this true nature. We have that true nature within us. We have that ultimate reality within ourselves. 
but it's covered up. It's blocked up. It's blocked up by the emotions. It's blocked up by our preconceived mental ideas, our, our mental conceptual conceptualizations and elaborations. And it's covered up by our, our habitual tendencies to always come back to these things. You know, the way we justify, well, it's this, this, and this. I understand that, but as soon as you say the but, that's the habitual tendency, but this. Now you're rationalizing the but, you know? So we need to be able to, to stop all that. We need to be able to cut ourselves off from all that. At some point, we just say, I'm going to stop playing the game. I'm going to stop chasing these thoughts. I'm going to stop doing this and be able to, to relax in that meditative state. But to get there, we got to go through this whole process of purification. Purification, all these attachments, all these aversions, all these jealousies, all this greediness. You know, so the, the five poisons that make up the 84,000 emotions that we talked about before. So as we do this, as we are going through this process, we begin to experience and develop realizations. So these realizations are these moments of aha. To use the analogy of the true nature, we have this true nature, or we have this, this diamond nature, this true nature, and then when things start breaking apart, you know, they just don't fall apart, they just start loosening up, and as they do, we say light, the truth, or the reality, the ultimate nature, starts coming through like light, and we have a, a glimpse after glimpse, after glimpse of, of what this ultimate true nature is. And as fast as it comes is as fast as it goes. But the more that we engage in the practice, the more that we engage in the contemplation and the meditation, the more we're able to control the mind to develop the one-pointed mindfulness so that we're not jumping from one thing to another. As soon as we have this thought, now we're jumping to another one. We need to be able to focus on the one thing so that we can exhaust that one thing. And as we do that, comes a realization. So that's maybe oversimplifying it a little bit, but it gives you the, the idea that by, by recognizing the obstacles, loosening up the obstacles, comes the truth of those, of, of of what those obstacles have been all this time and the simplicity of what the true nature is. So this is realization. So at what point, where does, um, where does uh, uh, ex experience become realization and realization become mindfulness and so on? So, that's a very interesting discussion to have, and we'll have that a little bit later. But right now, it's experience and realization that we're focusing on. So, so this emptiness, to come back to this, this idea of emptiness, is, is not, a, is not a, a nothingness. It's not a nihilism. A nihilism is like a nothingness, that nothing really exists, and, and uh, why bother, there's no morals, you know, all this is all fabricated and so on. This emptiness is characterized, this emptiness, which is an emptiness of our true nature, the primordial nature. And the primordial nature is another way of expressing bodhicitta, the holy enlightened mind. This is the spiritual mind. This is the big mind. This is the mind that, that is beyond comprehension, beyond expression, but at the same time, we need to be able to, to give it some kind of thing that we can, we can kind of point to, but, but not grasp on to. So I know this is 
very subtle. So this mind is the holy enlightened mind. This is the bodhicitta. So the characteristics of this emptiness is the loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity of the bodhicitta. The more that we are able to abide, to live, to be able to dwell, to be able to, our conduct is a result of these characteristics of the holy enlightened mind of bodhicitta, the more that we become the embodiment of that true nature of that light. So we can see that it, that it is, um, that it becomes present in that way. It's been present with us the whole time. We just haven't recognized it as that because it's been blocked up by the emotions, et cetera, the, the mental misconceptions and so on. So this is why we started with the bodhicitta, to look at the bodhicitta. Now we're looking at the bodhicitta from the ultimate state, from the ultimate, ultimate reality, from the ultimate truth not from the phenomenal truth. So this loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity is our human way of being able to explain it. But it is more profound than that. It is deeper than that. And again, has to be experienced. And once it's experienced, it gets to be realized. So these all go together. So all this is all, you know, it's intermingled with each other. So one of the great masters, Nagarjuna, who's considered in many Buddhist circles to be the, the second Buddha who lived around um, 200 AD or so, and he formulated the Mahayana teachings, the middle way teachings. The Buddha Shakyamuni taught them, but it was Nagarjuna that was able to bring them and, and put them into a, a, a scripture that could, be, um, that could be taken apart and put back together again, that could be studied and comprehended and so on. So he was considered to be the second Buddha in many circles. And he says he's, that, that there's nothing that is not emptiness. Nothing, no thing is emptiness. That emptiness pervades all this phenomenal nature. There is nothing that is not dependently originated. There is nothing that is dependently originated dependently original there is nothing that comes from its own self everything is compounded of many things being able to recognize that being able to see that is the essence of being able to put together phenomenal nature being able to recognize phenomenal nature so we say that this interdependence of all these things of, that are making up all this phenomenal nature is all karmically driven. That all this is a result of karma. Karma, cause, and result. You can't separate those three ideas, that they all come together. They're, they are all the same thing in terms of that there is a cause, there is, a, there is an action, and then there is a result that are happening simultaneously. So it was Nagarjuna who helped to define this for us, to be able to recognize this for ourselves. So this karmic, this karmic interdependence is the relative phenomena, the relative truth, and the emptiness, which is this ultimate wisdom, which is the truth of the relative. That sounds like, you know, double talk, are actually inseparable. And that sounds like a dualism. But 
it's hard, you know, my meek way of being able to to try and explain this is sort of like if you 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 can imagine space and then within space is this nested temporary reality but the space is limitless the space has is is unborn the space is behind beyond human comprehension but within this space is this nested relative this this phenomenal nature as we see it as human beings are human beings so that begs the question are human beings but a stepping stone to another reality to another dimension or multiple dimensions or something like that we don't know we can theorize we can make up all kinds of games about what we think it is and so on like that and many people do and part of buddhism takes a lot of delight in doing that you know but is that not chasing you know an object another object of the relative So this karmic interdependence is the weaving together of the causes and the conditions of the karmic results. So we say that that here's a cause, here's a thought, it precipitates an action, which then creates a result. And then, but that cause is there and doesn't manifest until the conditions are right for that manifestation. An example of that is the seed that we put into the ground. It's a seed of a tree or plant, whatever it is. There's that seed. And that seed, is you can hold it in your hand, you can do all kinds of things with it, and it just stays <clears throat> as a seed until the conditions are right, till it's it's got the right heat it's got the right moisture it's got the right nutrition and it's got the right space around it in which to grow and when those conditions are met that cause pops open and there's an action the action is the sprout and then the result becomes that the sprout grows into the apple tree or whatever so causes and conditions, you see, are part of this equation, if I can use that word, that is this weaving together of these karmic results of, these, of this karma. Thus, the truth of karmic interdependence, this relative truth, directly and naturally points to the truth of this emptiness, this ultimate truth, that everything is compounded. Everything is compounded in the relative sense. And it's inseparable. We can't take it apart. There is, there is that which is, we can, we can go beyond the, for lack of a better word, we can go beyond the relative into the space and become the space. We can see the relative and we can be part of the relative, but we're not subject to the relative. So this is a definition of the awakened one, of the Buddha. The Buddha sees all the suffering. The Buddha, the Buddha sees all the causes of the suffering and all the results of the suffering. It sees all the happiness and the causes and the results of the happiness. But the Buddha, the awakened one, is not affected by any of it. But it's aware of it. It's aware of the of the of the of the phenomenal nature. It is the space. It is the ultimate truth, that Buddha nature. But it's beyond our human comprehension to be able to define it any more than that. 
but we can experience it. <clears throat> so all this is happening within our big mind and our little mind. The big mind is experiencing it time and memorial. There's no time. There's no space. It is It is that. That's the suchness. That's the thatness. You'll, look, you'll read some books and you'll, you'll see that expressed, thusness and thatness of the mind. Such as it is. It's that. And if you haven't experienced it, it's just going to remain those words for you. But if you've experienced it, then you know what that is pointing to. The mind does have experiences and perceives everything with clarity. This big mind. It's a question of whether this little mind can comprehend that and how this little mind processes this here. If it's always trying to qualify it, it's going to do so with the emotions. It's going to color it as a human being would color it. And that's our human nature. Our human nature is to screw it all up. That's what we do. And you can see how excellent we are at that. But if we can see it and transcend that human condition into our primordial condition, to our, our primordial nature, then this relative nature just doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that it's nihilism because it, it matters in the sense that we couldn't get to recognize this phenomenal nature without having first had this materialistic phenomenal experience itself. So we have this gift of life. We have this gift of being a human being in order that we can move through it to figuratively something that is beyond that. So this emptiness, when we realize this emptiness, is when we realize the true nature of the mind. And we have to see the mind as simultaneously the little mind and the big mind. In the sense of the ultimate, there's no distinction. In the, in the sense of the phenomenal, there's duality. The appearances are understood to be inseparable from the mind's essence. The appearances are understood to be inseparable from the mind's essence, which is emptiness. And appearances and emptiness are also indivisible. This is the display of the appearances. This is the display of the Buddha mind. The display of the Buddha mind. We've talked about this before, you know, um, we, we're not going to get deep into this, but there's the, the Buddha mind, which is called the, um, the Dharmakaya. There's the, the Buddha speech, the intellectualization of that Buddha mind, which is called the Sambhogagaya. And there is the emanation of that Buddha mind into a into material form that is called the Nirmanakaya. The Dharmakaya remains that space, but it displays itself as the 
Sambhogakaya and as the Nirmanakaya in order that ordinary human beings can get an understanding, can have that experience. So, there's a leap of faith here. You know, this is a faith, this is a faith-based proposition. You know, we talk about, you know, well, you got to prove it to me. Before I, I can accept this, you got to prove it to me. You got to have one of the scientists write down the equation so I can follow it. I can recreate this. Otherwise, it ain't true. But then we're talking about something that can't be expressed. That's what spirituality is about. It's invisible to us. But yet we have this, this whole, it's part of who we are. And we can try and push it away. We can try and negate it and all this. But yet it may still come back to us and so on. So we, if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the three faiths, the three, the three, three trusting faiths. There was the, the yearning faith that I have this yearning within me. I have this spirituality within me that wants to come out, but I have no way of having it come out, but I got this out and I'm looking for some way to do it. And then you meet a teacher who says, well, here is how, we explain this and here are some books and you can study this yourself and and you need to comprehend this self uh, you need to comprehend this yourself you need to experience this for yourself i can only point you in a direction and you have to have faith in that teacher and in that body of 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 teachings that the teacher is presenting to you you have to have faith in that and then if you're fortunate if you have really committed yourself to this process, you have the clear faith of the experience. That transcendent experience of transcending what it is to be a human being. And not everybody's going to buy into that. And that's what defines a spiritual person, a truly spiritual person. There's a vicarious spiritual person who is who is a holy person who is following all the all the rules and so on like that and they're a holy person and we we do that you know we're we're role playing to be able to to get to that point you know we're we're clearing our lives we're cleaning up our lives and so on so that we can have that experience it's part of the process but then to truly recognize to realize to open yourself up to have that experience then to become that that um, that that spiritual being, then is that clarity, and we call that. There's a name for that. They call that the the Mahamudra, or the Zogchen, or the clear light, or the um, or the um, the the. Um, The pristine cognition, the pristine cognition. So these are all intellectuals, physio of, of, you know, philosophic names for this transcendent true nature that we have within ourselves. So does anybody have any comments or questions about this? I don't know. I actually see it slightly different than what you were saying in terms of like the leap of faith aspect of it. Maybe some with like the some things about the true nature or something. But for me, at least things like um, certain things around like karma and rebirth are things that tend to are uh, require a bit more of like a leap of faith, not that they can't be experienced by certain people at certain times, but for me, at least like something like emptiness, particularly looking at like uh, 
like Nargajuna's work and um, even just just through intellectually, like this very tight logic around it in terms of like being able to cut down all of our concepts and uh, and everything and even have some experiences that approximate some brief kind of non-dual type of experiences. I've had things like that for me. So yeah, for me, it, it feels like less of a leap of faith with when it comes to emptiness. Not that I completely understand it or understand all the implications of it, but I don't know if that's how other people feel than some other things that take a bit more of a leap of faith for me. Well, I think you're you're just saying it in in relative terms, and yes, that you're that that leap of faith comes in little 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 uh, experiences or little agreements or little uh, uh, you know shoots of light that are coming through. So that when you get to the emptiness idea, you've already laid all the groundwork uh, in order to be able to take that that leap to be able to understand that. I think it's all part of the same thing, in other words, just looking at it from different points of view. Does that make sense? I mean, is it different? Are you saying that it's that that your view of karma is different than the view of emptiness? Um, I mean, with the huge caveat of I certainly don't claim to have a, some kind of great understanding of, of either of them, really, but only in only in the sense of with the emptiness it, it can at least how i'm talking about it there, there's like a very tight logic that you can get there now that's just the intellectual level to point to something else it's negating everything obviously it's not proposing something it's negating something but where you can get to like with a very very what i find a very convincing tight logic like nargajun is particularly like his uh his his reasoning in uh like his texts and the uh, garland of views and stuff in a way that's harder with other things I, this maybe this isn't an important point but just like with things like karma and things you know that some of it there's some of the things that are just very hard to be able to see unless you're basically enlightened or to get a feel for to be able to get there through through reason which obviously it's all pointing beyond reason anyway but i don't know okay thank you i have a question though real quick um is what's being pointed to with like the realization of emptiness and uh the the same thing as like um as non-duality as yes okay non-duality would 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 rest in that same big mind because you would see you would see the emptiness of the duality And again, we're using words, you know, seeing, you know, we're, you know, experiencing realization, you know, our, uh, we're using words to be able to, to do that. Does anybody want to stand up and stretch, take a drink of water? you know, have a minute because the next thing I want to do, I'm glad to answer any questions I can to discuss any points that you raise, but I do want to get to uh, reciting the Heart Sutra, which is in your 101 book. So if you need a break, now would be the time to do that. If no break is necessary, then we'll get right into it. But this Heart Sutra may help us to, um, through a practice, open at least a window into that vicarious experience of letting go. Because the, the experience is not one that we see, it, there's nothing to be seen. And as long as we're looking for something to be seen, we're going to miss the point. So, you know, 
we see how how the words and the concepts kind of fall into each other. They kind of open up, but then they fall into each other. You know, they rise up out of these explorations, but then they disintegrate the more that you look at them and they just dissolve away. So there's explosion and there's implosion. You know, so what are we talking about? Another set of dualities. I have a question about the impermanence and permanence. Yes. Um, how do like certain psychics or astrologers know uh, know people's past lives? Um, if that life was impermanent, but there's an entity in the future or something that's like, oh, I can sense your past life. Take, for example, Edgar Casey and the ARE in Virginia Beach and the 9,000 um, individuals that he could explain their past lives to. Like, where is he getting the information or not necessarily just him, but there's other mystics who seemingly have the ability to pull this impermanent information of a past permanence and deliver it to the individual um, who seemed, I I you understand. know what I mean? Yeah, there's two ways of looking at it. One way is, I certainly don't know. <laughs> and I don't know where it's explained. You know, it's, it's sensationalism, you know, at the least, you know, and, and it's like the, uh, uh, like the fakirs, you know, who lay down on the bed of nails and who, you know, raise their hand, they hold their hand up for, you know, the next 35 years and, and that's their spiritual connection or, you know, they, they pull, uh, you know, uh, tanks around with their folded up penis and stuff like that. You know, they can do all these things because they have focused one, their mind, one pointed, one pointedly on these on these different objects and so on, and they're able to do these what seem to be supernatural things, you know. So how much do we give them credit? You know, uh, do they really do they really see these lives, or are they just convincing us in such a way that we're saying, "Oh yeah, this must be true." You know, where is the proof? What's the proof? Or is there no proof because it really isn't true? You know, so. Um, you know, so from one, so that's one point of view. The other point of view is that they're really able to do these things through their spirituality, through their, their divine quality or something like that. And they're able to explain these things and, and so on like that. But why is it that they're all, you know, human experiences? Why is it that they're always on this planet? Why aren't they on the planet Seremus, you know, in some other, you know, 18th dimension or something like that? You know, the, why don't they really blow our minds? And, um, and, and, and is this not part of what we call what the transpersonal? This empathetic joy that we are all going through. And I can see the happiness. I can see the suffering. I can see everything in between. And so can you and everybody else can, can recognize that. And, and we can transfer that, you know, going back 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, whatever. And we can, we can project that for the future. And we can look at it as that it's happening in real time and everybody else's life and so on. And was this, was this maybe what the, the Buddha, Shakyamuni, who was uh, talking about when he said that, during his meditation, when he first experienced enlightenment, that he could see all these different lives and so on, his lives and the lives of others and the causes of, of others and everything. Was this the transpersonal? From my point of view, I don't know. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know? And I don't know. But it makes a lot of sense that there's more... Uh, you know, we, already, we don't know. 
Yeah. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it's easier to create these stories and these fantasies. And if that's what they are, you know, if they're, if it's reality, there's another point say, what happens when we die? All right. Say here, here's how many of us are here, six or seven of us are here right now. And we all have this, this spirit within us. We have this life energy within ourselves. Right. And then say we all died right now while we're watching this. And I'm not trying to be a, a cult leader or anything like that, but say we all died or so we have to release this energy and we release this energy through the crown of our head. We go through this whole thing and, and there's a whole thing about that and everything. But then what do we, what do we come together? Can we come together? If we all have this, this mindfulness that we've all been de developing, this one-pointed mindfulness, that when we leave our physical body, when we leave our intellectual brain, can we then, this energy, come together and coalesce? Can we coalesce as some being? That, and, and this being becomes one of those great figures of history who is able to capture the imaginations of so many other uh, 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 ordinary people because they are the composite of so many other beings who, who were thinking all the same thing about the same time with each other. So they coalesce together. So maybe some of these beings, maybe that's a way in which this manifests. You know, it said in the Bardo Total that when we when we pass and we become the spirit, you know, just un, this uh, unbodied spirit and everything, that we can become, you know, these these Buddhas, you know, these awakened beings and so on in the Bardo of reality and and so on. And if if and and maybe one of the things that we come together as is the Buddha Maitreya, the future Buddha who that when the teachings of Buddha Shakyamuni, who we are now in this kalpa of Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings, this reality or whatever you want to call it, of, of his teachings, when all that passes away, when people stop following that, does Buddha Maitreya appear, another appearance? another Nirmanakaya appearance of that Dharmakaya, and we become Buddha Maitreya, that our spirituality all comes together. So an example would be if you take a flashlight and you shine it on the wall, and then Karina, she takes a flashlight and she shines it on the same spot on the wall, and, and Matthew's able to do it, and uh, Emmanuel is able to do it, and Kate's able to do it, and Zara is able to do it, and I'm able to do it. And each of us is taking that flashlight, our own flashlight, and shining it on that same spot. Does that spot of light get brighter and denser? Uh, yes. Right. So does that happen spiritually? Um. I can assume. I don't know, but it's certainly a an interesting uh, way to explain it, isn't it? Yeah, it, you all this. It makes me think of Elon Musk, and he's uh, trying to make fashionable us sticking electrodes in artificial intelligence in the back of our minds with Neuralink, and it's like, how did this type of influence get into one person? But that's another question that <laughs> you don't have to answer that one. <laughs> well, that's up to you. Right. I, I choose not. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> thank you for your call. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All right. Then please go to your one-on-one books. I go to page 14 and 15 and uh, 16 and 17. So we're going to recite this together. So I wish we could do it all with our microphones on at one time, but that just leads to a cacophony of noise that boggles everybody's mind. So, but please recite this out loud. It's very important to do these things. Um, in this booklet, we've only kept the English, but it is in Sanskrit form, but for us to understand the meaning, we need to do it in the English. 
So it's the meaning that we're going for here, and we can do the Sanskrit later and try and have this transcendent experience as a result of that. But right now we'll have to do it through our intellect. <clears throat> so we're going to read this together. So there'll be a couple parts where I'll ask you to follow my instructions. So we begin at the page 14, the Heart Sutra. We recite together. Beyond words, beyond description, prajna paramita. Unborn, unceasing, the very essence of space. Yet it can be experienced as the wisdom of our own awareness. Homage to the mother of the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya. In Tibetan, Chomden Dema Sherab Gi Paro Tu Chimpe Nimpo. In English, the Heart Sutra. Homage to the essence of the transcendental knowledge, the Bhagavati. Thus, I have heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in the royal domain of the Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of monks and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi, which examines the dharmas called profound illumination. And at that same time, noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, looking at the profound practice of transcendent knowledge, saw the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to the noble Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva Mahasattva, How should those noble men and women learn who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge? Thus he spoke. And noble Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva Mahasattva answered the venerable Shariputra with these words. Shariputra those noble men and women who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge should look at it like this. The five skandhas should be seen purely in their natural emptiness. Form is emptiness. Emptiness itself is form. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, concept, and consciousness are emptiness. Feeling is emptiness. Emptiness itself is feeling. Emptiness is no other than feeling. Feeling is no other than emptiness. Perception is emptiness. Emptiness itself is perception. Emptiness is no other than perception. Perception is no other than emptiness. Concept is emptiness. Emptiness itself is concept. Emptiness is no other than concept. Concept is no other than emptiness. Consciousness is emptiness. Emptiness itself is consciousness. Emptiness is no other than consciousness. Consciousness is no other than emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness and have no characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are not impure or pure. They neither decrease nor increase. Therefore, Shariputra, since there is emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no concept, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no sensation, no dharmas. There is no quality of sight, and so on until no quality of thought and no quality of mind consciousness. There is no ignorance and no wearing out of ignorance and so on until no old age and death, nor their wearing out. In the same way, there is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending of suffering, and no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. 
Therefore, Shariputra, since there is no attainment for the Bodhisattvas, they abide by means of transcendental knowledge. And since there is no obscurity of mind, they have no fear. They transcend falsity and pass beyond the bounds of sorrow. All the Buddhas who dwell in the past, present, and future fully and clearly awaken to the unsurpassed true complete enlightenment by means of transcendental, transcendental knowledge. Therefore, the mantra of transcendental knowledge, the mantra of deep insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra which calms all suffering should be known as truth, for there is no deception. The mantra of transcendental knowledge is proclaimed, Teata, Om, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Buddhi, Soha. This is it. The enlightened body, speech, and mind of the enlightened one is gone, gone, really gone. The enlightened Buddha field, so be it. Shariputra, this is how a Bodhisattva Mahasattva should learn the profound transcendent knowledge. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised the noble Bodhisattva Mahasattva Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well done, well done, noble son, it is so, it is just so. Profound transcendent knowledge should be practiced just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, the Venerable Shariputra and the Noble Bodhisattva Mahasattva Avalokiteshvara, that whole gathering and the world with its gods, men, Azuras, and Gandavas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Thus ends the Mahayana Sutra called the Bhagavati, Essence of Transcendent Knowledge. So now recite with me this mantra. We'll do this 11 times. And the translation again, Teata, is this is it. Om is the enlightened body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. Gate means gone. Gate means gone. Paragate means really gone. Parasam gate, buddy, means the enlightened Buddha field. Gone to the enlightened Buddha field. Soha means so be it. Teata, Om, Gate, Gate, Para, Gate, Para, Sam, Gate, Buddy, So, Ha. Teata, Om, Gate, Gate, Para, Gate, Para, Sam, Gate, Buddy, So, Ha. Teata, Om, Gate, Gate, Para, Gate, Para, Sam, Gate, Buddy, So, Ha. Teata, Om, Gate, Gate, Para, Gate, Para, Sam, Gate, Buddy, So, Ha. Teata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddy Soha Teata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddy Soha Teata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddy Soha Teata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddy Soha Keep your back straight, relax in the five, the seven point posture of Varanchana. Keep your back straight. Maybe keep your eyes closed. And visualize the mantra. Teata, gate, gate, paragam, parasam, gate, bodhisoha. Going around your heart center, radiating light in all directions and dissolving into space, dissolving into the emptiness.
Jaya Gate Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddhi Soha Teata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddhi Soha Teata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddhi Soha Teata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddhi Soha they are down, got the got the paragot, the pass, I'm got the body so hot. They are down, got the got the paragot, the pass, I'm got the body so hot. They are down, got the got the paragot, the pass, I'm got the body so hot. They are down, got the got the paragot, the pass, I'm got the body so hot. They are down, got the got the paragot, the pass, I'm got the body so hot. They are down, got the got the paragot, the pass, I'm got the body so they are down, got the got the power, got the power, some got the body so hard. They are down, got the got the power, got the power, some got the body so hard. They are down, got the got the power, got the power, some got the body so hard. They are got the power, got the power, some got the body so hard. They are down, got the got the power, got the power, some got the body so hard. They are down, got the body. Power some got the body so hard. They are down. They are got the pairs, I'm got the bodies over. They are down, got the got the pair, got the pairs, I'm got the bodies over. They are down, got the got the pair, got the pairs. Theata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Buddhi Soha. Open your eyes, page 17. Namo, homage to the Lama, homage to the Buddhas, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha, homage to the Great Mother, transcendent knowledge. May all my words be accomplished. Just as formerly Indra, Lord of the gods, contemplating the profound meaning of transcendent knowledge, recited these words, and by that turned back all evil and other disagreeable elements, may I too, by contemplating the profound meaning of transcendent knowledge and reciting the words, make all evil and other disagreeable elements turn back. May they be destroyed. May they be calmed. May they be totally calmed. May they be destroyed. May they be calmed. May they be totally calmed. May they be destroyed. May they be calmed. May they be totally calmed. Whatever is interdependent, arising from connection, is without cessation and without birth, without end and without permanence, without coming and without going, without division and without unity of meaning. All conditions fully released, teaching release. I bow to the sacred words of the perfect Buddha. May there be good fortune. Om Ah Hom.
So that's the Heart Sutra. This is called the Prajnaparamita. The Prajnaparamita is much longer than this. The Prajnaparamita means, Prajna means wisdom, the ultimate wisdom. Paramita means the perfection, the perfection of perfect, uh, the perfection of, of ultimate wisdom. And in this is this particular part of the sutra, the Heart Sutra, is the Diamond Sutra, and is the Lotus Sutra, among other teachings, other, other practices. So Buddha Shakyamuni was in the midst of many, many beings, many, many monastics, many, many bodhisattvas, spiritual beings, holy beings, ordinary beings, and he goes into this samadhi. And he's like channeling these deities from his heart center, from his heart, from his diamond heart center. And through through that, he is giving these teachings spontaneously. These experiences spontaneously, showing us that it's possible, showing, giving us permission to engage in these practices ourselves. Because all that anyone can do for any one of us is point us in the direction. But it's up to each and every one of us to make the journey ourselves. So the invitation is there. Okay. Any more comments or questions? So I need a little bit of feedback. Emanuela, would you uh, please give me a comment? What do you think of this? Sorry, I'm making some tea and I could barely hear. Did you ask me something? Well, I was asking what you thought of this. Um, It was great, yeah. And this was a big part of my last lineage, the Prashant Paramita. Uh, but I never got the text like this, so it was, it was good to go over it and see the translation directly. Uh, Very good. Thank you. Matthew, how about you? Uh, that was that was quite, that was awesome. That was great. Uh, I don't know. It stilled my, uh, stilled my busy mind, so I don't know how to... For once, I don't have a lot to say, to be honest. It was really nice. Do you find it, I'm, I'm asking leading questions, do you find Please. it inspirational? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Karina, what did you think of this? Um, it's uh, great. Beautiful. Have you ever heard of this before? The no. Heart Sutra? Mm-mm. No. Mm -hmm. Gavin, how about you? Have you heard of this before? Um, I haven't heard about it. I started thinking about, you know, if we clap and something is destroyed, does that entangle us into the karma of destroying an entity? <laughs> I think you just let it go. <laughs> okay. And then form of Indra, the, that's the Hindu god's name. Yes, and, he was the king of the gods. And then is there really enemies or are we just manufacturing them out of what we perceive to be good and evil? Because a barbarian's idea of evil is a good person, right? Right. And if a barbarian sat down and he's like, you know, then his or her barbarianistic vision is for good people to disappear. So it's interesting that this whole idea of 
clapping. Well, part, of it, part of it is cultural, you know, and, and that last page is the, is the, you know, the, um, the dissolution, you know, of what we have, you know, created, you know, uh, the, the, that we have, you know, come to, to recite, to pass, you know, this, this mantra, Teotahum Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sam Gati is, is, the liber, is liberating, is letting go of all these things. You know, so the expression of the clapping and so on is just, you know, reaffirming that now in our ordinary mind. Because we've come back, you know, this is the dissolution. We've come back in our ordinary mind. Now we're, we're, we're understating, you know, that which we maybe realized during the recitation. Oh, I also uh, thought it was interesting, the Bhagavad. Was a, there was we were pronouncing Bhagavati, and it, it reminded me of the Bhagavad Gita, and uh, then I started thinking about Professor Oppenheimer when he detonated the atomic bomb, and right. it, in my mind, just you know, <laughs> from one topic to the next. <laughs> well, and that's fine, and that's good, you know, and and to be able to make all those connection points, to be able to see because. Um, the common language of the Hindu and, and of the Tibetan uh, and was the Sanskrit. Right. So, so all this comes out of that. And, and uh, you know, in many ways, the, the Buddhism was prophesied by the, the Hindus before, you know, the, the Buddha was prophesied by the Hindus and the Jains before the Buddha appeared. That's very interesting. Kind of like the uh, the Jewish people prophesize the formation of God into an entity or a human body. Exactly. Interesting. Yes. I have a, a question, Lance. One thing that I've never quite understood about the Heart Sutra is when he's saying they're saying um, you know practice the profound perfection of wisdom in this way. It's like what do they mean by like what is the practicing of it that they're referring to? Because it sounds like in the text. Giving kind of it sounds like an explanation of what is meant by emptiness and how it it uh how all things are empty and like you know but the emptiness is also the form the form is also the emptiness and everything but in terms of like the practice itself like that's how they should practice it what what exactly does they mean by that the recitation of the mantra oh, okay the mantra is the vocalization is the is the expression of being that primordial buddha i see okay so, I mean, we did it 21 times, but do it 21 mile rounds, or do it for a day, or do it for two days, or three days, do it for a week. I mean, this is when the long retreats, I mean, this is what the long retreats are about, to really, truly, you know, develop that one-pointed mindfulness, to let all the the, the mundane stuff just evaporate and just become one with these with these mantras this is our connection point the vajrayana is also called the mantrayana because it's the mantrayana is the vehicle is the way in which we are doing this connecting our body speech and mind with with our with our you know to our big mind Zara, what are your comments on this, please? Um, so as we were going through it, I was, my, my main questions are more practical, I think, from like how to use it in my day-to-day -day life, um, just because of where I am along my journey, where I'm taking these things, like I, I believe and, and I'm all, like I'm in, I'm in full in with my, my journey with Buddhism. And so it's incorporating these elements. So like, for example, a practical shift I've made in the last couple of weeks of our courses is I've started shifting my focus in meditation to the four thoughts that turn the mind. Um, and so like now I just meditate on those in three minute cycles and it's actually had a profound impact on me by shifting um, and reducing monkey mind by just doing three minutes on each of those four elements. And that's a shift I've made in the last couple of weeks. So me, it's an issue of practicality of when to use this, um, and I heard you just talk about it, about the retreats and, and getting single um, focused, but from a practical day to day, 
how would we go about using this outside of these groups um, to, well, to help? It becomes, it become, you become the embodiment of it. So if you are taking advantage of of doing the practice and you know hopefully first thing in the morning because that really is the best time to do it but if that's not practical another time of day is okay but it will it will begin to affect your life in in so many ways because you become the embodiment of this of this truth of the mm -hmm. paramita and that wisdom will come up in ways that you didn't expect that it will come up you will see it working because this is your natural state and that the your your ordinary state what we call your ordinary state will just give way right now that ordinary state has been suppressing the spiritual but when the spiritual becomes emphasized then that's going to include the ordinary it's not going to push it away it brings it in and it transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary so that the order the, what was the extraordinary in the sense the the spirituality now that becomes ordinary and and the mundane becomes extraordinary wow that's very what you just said was very profound like those two sentences um I'm going to think about that because that's like, uh, I'll be interested to know when I experience that shift and how many people are aware of it happening, like, or if it's so slow and steady that you don't even realize the tipping point of like, oh my gosh, ordinary is extraordinary and extraordinary is ordinary now. That's so cool that you just said that. Good Very good. Katie, how about you? What do you think about this? Well, you know, I'm 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 familiar with uh, reciting the the Heart Sutra. It's something I've done before in classes and uh, and also on my own. And uh, recently, Kempa Samduk gave gave a teaching on it, and he had us read it through once, and including reciting for one mala round of the mantra. Uh, but then he told us it's good to recite it seven times in a day. So our homework was to recite it six more times that day. And I guess that was a little taste of what you were talking about, really immersing yourself in it. So, you know, you can't, I guess, if you want to do it for a, a longer period of time than, than just one go round, you can do it by reciting the mantra more times, but you can also punctuate it with reciting the entire sutra, you know, this shortened version of it many times. I, I think that's a nice practice. So there's many ways that you can incorporate it is, and, you know, and that's, the, you know, that's how we develop our, our personal practice. We learn how to do it in this, you know, more rigid or, you know, constructed structural way, but then we can modify it into our own lifestyle mm -hmm. and the more that we do it the more we want to do it you know it's the same with all these things hey katie how how much time do you spend a day on on intentional uh practice like meaning like like contrived artificial time where you're literally i'm just doing this as my activity well because my day-to-day -day schedule is very different and just even the the, the texture of my days are very different sometimes Honestly, it's a very short period of time, maybe 10 minutes in the morning. I always try to get a little bit in the morning uh, to start my day, but I, uh, I'm not as much of a morning person as I should be perhaps, so I'm often short on time. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm doing it uh, I could do a couple of hours, you know, if I, if I'm spending my day at Dharma Surya, I'll do the uh, daily practice on Zoom, and then I will do uh, more prayers and, and uh, sewer in the evening with Anigamso, so that adds up to quite a bit. Sometimes I, I do my own too, you know, a little chin raise egg or something. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. But it, I think it's good to have 
a consistency, even if it's just a few prayers that you say once a day, but, and if you keep going to that every single day, it's like drops into a bucket. And it doesn't seem like much, but eventually the bucket will overflow. But then you're not limited to that. You can, you can add on to that as you have time and inclination. That's actually really helpful. I have to forget like daily habits, they get to a tipping point and then all of a sudden you're, like Lance just said, all of a sudden you are ordinary, it's extraordinary and extraordinary became ordinary. And that's a, that's a collection of habits that slow drips over time. And all of yeah, a sudden, I think, yeah. I think he phrased it wonderfully, yes. Yeah, so that's to your point, what you just said about how you practice. I actually like that, and I think it provides um, grace for each of us as we go through our day, the reality of the conventional day. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, something I was thinking too, and, and what I'm doing with my practice is actually very similar, Zara, to what what you're saying you're doing, of like really focusing on the four thoughts and like drilling that home, or even doing like writing on it. And because for me, it's like that's. It feels like the key thing I need that actually like propels me going forward is getting away from the uh, the eight worldly dharmas. But what and the one thing that at times can be it, it's kind of for me has been a bit of a double edged sword with like Tibetan Buddhism it's, itself is that it's so special in the sense like it's so complete and like there's so much depth to it and there's such a variety of methods like unlike any I've looked at lots of different spiritual traditions I've never found anything like Tibetan Buddhism, widely speaking, but it's also, at least for me, it's possible to get like lost in it. Like there's so many different kinds of practices and so many different kinds of teachings and so many methods and this and this and this, that it's like, sometimes it gets like, I, I start to get like too overwhelmed when I'm trying to, I, well, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I'm trying to like focus like, okay, this is like the one thing right now that I feel like I need to drill into my, my little brain until uh, for the time being or something. Matt, well, I totally I agree with you. Sorry, I was going to say, Matt, I agree with you. That's why when um, Lance sent the transformation of suffering, I intellectually digested that because I was getting lost, almost like I didn't have the requisite prerequisite skills to mm, understand yeah. some, like the term, the terminologies where I'm like having like a like an index card of this word means this. Um, so I can totally empathize with what you just said in relation to you. it is so complete. Um, and how what's the best way to digest it? Like, you know, one piece at a time to where it's practical, yet you really get it. So I can appreciate what you just said. Yeah. And that's been a real gift for me from these, having these classes. And it's very important to me to come to these things. It's offered like even just being here and doing it and being around other people, but then also it's, it's given a structure to my practice in a way that I haven't had before. That's been, is really special for me. Good, thank you. Yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do is trying to give you a, a structure that you can follow a repeatable plan and and stay with it as much as you can. You can, you know, you can make some tweaks for your own self, but uh, but this is a, uh, a long uh, process for the rest of your life and changes will come and and uh, there'll be growth out of this out of this plan out of the structures. So you'll see it. But uh, it comes from the commitment to uh, to doing this, to following through with this, and not allow yourself to to go on these tangential trips that we'd like to go to because we have that monkey mind. You know, we want to learn more and so on. It'll come. It'll come. So uh, the next big thing that we're going to get into is is going to be uh, shamatha, calm abiding med uh, meditation. And Vipassana meditation. And then after that will be deity yoga meditation. So, but we've got to get this firm foundation of what we've been building on uh, first. Yes, Katie. I just wanted to comment a little more on the consistency because you reminded me that the, uh, the Thursday evening medicine Buddha practice that we've been doing has really been an important factor for me and just experiencing what it's like to return to the same practice again and again. It is very tempting to jump around and try a lot of different things, but there's a lot to be gained from, from that consistency. You really deepen your relationship with the, with the deity or, or the concept that you keep going back to. 
That's absolutely right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So Thursday nights, for those of you who didn't know or haven't made the time, Thursday night we do Medicine Buddha. And Medicine Buddha is there for all beings. It doesn't matter whether they're Buddhist or not. And in the Medicine Buddha practice, we recite the 12 vows that the Bodhisattva Medicine Buddha took to become Medicine Buddha. And you find that it applies to all the other Bodhisattvas and Buddhas. So it's part of the process. You do one practice, you see how it's the same practice for for all the other deities that we will engage in. It's only a matter of their activity that is different. Medicine Buddha is healing. But Shanrezig would be compassion. Manjushri would be wisdom. Green Tara would be fearlessness. So there's many, many others. But it's all made up of the same basic frame, the same elements. So. Question. Um, is Prajnaparamita, is it the fe uh, the feminine embodiment of wisdom? or Yes. It's the mother, the mother, the mother of wisdom, Prajnaparamita, that's correct. And she has a golden body and she has, I think, six arms. And yes, yeah, so there is a, there is an iconography that's associated with Prajnaparamita. But that iconography is only to be a symbol, you know, to help us remember, you know, uh, our one-pointed mindfulness at all different levels, at the form level, at the speech level, and at the heart level. But it, it, it's manifest within ourselves, within our own heart. Yes. So, yeah, so the, the, the mother wisdom is the, is, is the Tara, you know, that we all come from a mother, you know, and that's one thing that we all share. And we all come from a mother. We all come from the womb. And that's often expressed as the lotus. You know, and we all are lotus born in that regard. So, and that lotus wisdom is what we're coming to recognize. That indestructible, holy wisdom, that perfect wisdom is what we're coming to realize. We have it within ourselves. So going to Zara's question earlier about, you know, how does this affect our lives? It will do it automatically. It will do it naturally, you know, and we'll, we'll find ourselves saying these things and thinking these things without any re reference to notes or anything like that, because we become the embodiment of it. We've removed the places we remove the afflictive emotions and now what comes out is our natural wisdom and it's amazing it's magnificent then we see oh there it is that's the clear faith when we see it actually working effortlessly and then once that happens, it can never, ever be taken away from you. You always have it. You may suppress it for a while, but you can always bring it back. You can always remember it. You can always come back to it. And that's what we're doing because we've all been there before. We've all been this Buddha nature. We are the essence of us is Buddha nature. And we slowly, slowly begin to, to recognize and remember that. To say, oh, this is what it is. This is the peace that I've wanted all the time. It's been there the whole time. I just wouldn't let myself enjoy it. <clears throat> okay. So now we'll go to uh, page uh, 18 in our book and read the uh, recite the uh, dedication prayers. So please read along with us out loud. And it's important to do these things out loud. So uh, we're hearing ourselves do it. We're, we're engaging our body. We're engaging our intellectual mind to open up our heart center. So it's important to do these with, with devotion and with power. Page 18. 
Dorje Chang, Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Dormalor Gampopa, Pagma Drupa, and Lordri Kumpa, please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessing of all the Kaju Lamas. By this virtue, may I achieve the all-knowing state. And may all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind. Where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. I pray that the Lama may have good life. I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri, the warrior, realized the ultimate state, and as did Samantabhadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all the merit for all sentient beings. By the blessing of the Buddha who attained the three kayas, by the blessing of the truth of the unchanging Dharma as such, by the blessing of the indivisible Sangha order, may the merit I share bear fruit. By the virtues collected by, in the three times, by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate word of virtue, may I and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Sri Kumpa Ratna Sri, who is omniscient, Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas, divine assembly of Yidams and assemblies of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis, and Dakinis, dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate word of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a shravaka or pratyakabuddha. May all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, Obstructors who harm, misleading Mars, and the hordes of demons experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings through my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I in any case gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Om, ah, hong. Om, ah, hong. Om, ah, hong. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you all very much. It's wonderful to be here with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank, a good Thank day. you, everybody. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Okay.
Thank you, Katie. Always a pleasure, Lance. I'm glad you're here.